Hello, everyone. Welcome to our China Speed Live. Uh, I'm Miro. Uh, I'm the founder of China Bow Academy. So today, uh, we will. This webinar will be about the indie brand secret of success in China. And I'm very happy to have Julian here. Uh, he's the founder of Super Ordinary. Uh, Super Ordinary is a beauty incubator located in Shanghai. And they have already been working with a lot of international indie beauty brands. So before we start, just let me um, introduce a bit about China Speed and also China Bow Academy first. So China Bow Academy is a training and resources sharing platform. We offer courses, workshops about China business, internet, e-commerce, and marketing. And China Speed is powered by China Bow Academy. So for each episode of China Speed Live, we will invite a guest from um, China e-commerce industry or marketing or social media or um, KOLs or MCN, etc. So we will be talking about uh, the, their insights and their experience in China market. So for um, today's event, uh, it will last for around an hour. So we will, I will first interview Julian and then we will have a Q&A session at the end. So uh, please mute yourself and also turn off your camera during this event. And also it's being recorded. So we will post a replay video on our website tomorrow. And also if you have any questions during the event, please just use the chat box to uh, type your questions and we will try to answer them at the end of this event. And also for other queries, you can just contact Julian directly. So first, Mm, maybe, Julian, could you uh, introduce a bit about yourself and also your company first? Um, hi, hi, everyone. Um, good, good evening or good morning, wherever you guys are. Um, I'm Julian Reese. I'm the founder of Super Ordinary. And um, I thought I'd, this morning I'll start off by just doing a little bit of introduction on our company. And, um, you know, then Mira can ask some questions or if you'd like to ask some questions directly, happy to walk through. Um, so Super Ordinary is a company I started um, about two and a half years ago in Shanghai. Um, it was really born out of, um, I guess, a need when I was um, a, a co-founder of a brand in America, which was Laundry, and really trying to understand how to bring the brand into um, um, into China. Um, you know, I think in 2015 we were all kind of blessed with, you know, how influencer marketing was really taken hold of many brands and how brands were growing in the US. But when it came to um, the China market, I found it was very, um, you know, one, the ecosystem was extremely complicated. Um, you had many different platforms that didn't talk to each other, but also I found that it was, um, um, you know, the, the way that a KOL in, um, interacts with a brand was obviously very different. Um, so, so first of all, let me just introduce to Ordinary. So, Super Ordinary, we, um, you know, we have a, a portfolio of brands. Um, um, we're very, very proud of the brands we manage. Um, we see ourselves as, you know, real, truly their partners in, in China and um, other parts of the world. Um, we typically work with a brand on a distribution, exclusive distribution basis, and some brands we have joint ventures with. Um, you can see the brands we work with, Pharmacy, Melon & Getz, you know, Drunk Elephant Way, ordinary um you know many of these brands um, you'd recognize in in the global markets whether they're in sephora or ulta um but we you know we truly believe a lot of our brands they really do stand for something um they have very strong um, dna and mission statements and you know, that's really what i love about working with these incredible brands is that they're um you know they, they resonate not only for the public but just me myself i really enjoy working with them um, so what do we do? Um, you know, I, I don't like to classify Super Ordinary as a trade partner. I really think what we truly are as an extension of the brand wherever they may be. Um, I spend a lot of my time with the founders of each of the, um, of the brands to really truly understand you know, what makes them tick and, and how they differentiate themselves in a very saturated market in their own, in their own market. And then really try and figure out what we could do with them in China, and 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 you know we're always thinking about the long term. So all this brand will be with us in five years or ten years. So we we handle everything. So in our office we have um, 
in Shanghai. We have 150 employees, um, just about, um, all based in Shanghai. Everyone's in the business has been in beauty for you know, a number of years, I think on average of 10 years. Um, and um, I think where we over-index is typically we're very, very heavy into marketing and, and social commerce is the backbone of our business. So we pick up products wherever it may be and the distribution center, we bring it over and we handle everything from customer service to marketing campaigns to um, you know, logistics to all the social media accounts. And um, you know, we've now really invested over the last 18 months in our live streaming capabilities. So um, as you may know, most of you were familiar with what's the, the online and offline distribution model in China, but um, you know, most people are very familiar with the Taobao and the Xiaohongshu and the T-Mobile channels, but there are many, many other channels which are always popping up. I mean, channels like Billy Billy or Pindodo or Douyin, or these are really important channels for every single beauty brand that enters the market. So to really, truly operate a brand in China, you really have to be able to be um, a native in, in each one of these channels because none of them talk to each other. The other thing is um, what people are realizing is that there are so many different ways to distribute your products in China. Um, it's not just Sephora, it's, you know, it's the colorist, which all wow the color. And these are really exciting um, distribution channels because um, the one thing that, you know, I've noticed over the last couple of years is that the, the Chinese consumer is in the discovery mode. They're always wanting to be the first and um, to hold the product, to test it, and to share it across their WeChat moments or their social channels. Um, you know, one, th one trend to notice here is that a lot of these products are indexing closer to the 100 RMB mark. So already they're a lot cheaper than the international brands. Um, these two, just these two chains, which I'm showing you right now, um, they both are on track to do maybe three, four hundred units of stores over the, in 2020. And um, over 70% of the brands within these stores are local brands. I think that's very important to know. So, you know, when people think about, you know, China as becoming like the holy grail for bringing international brands, it's very competitive with the new C beauty brands, just as we saw with K beauty or J beauty. Um, so just to give you an example of how we work with um, our, our brand partners, we, we handle everything with on the social media side. So um, in, in this example, Melon and Getz, which is one of our, uh, one of our great brands, um, we work with um, a lot of live streamers and just as you would expect to in, in any other market, you have to do a lot of warm up before the actual live, live streaming event. And um, here's, a, here's just an example where we've done this on, on, on Taobao and Xiaomi. Here is um, Austin Lee. Everyone knows who Austin Lee is. Um, we work with him very, very actively across our portfolio. I actually think I can play this. Let me see if this works. Um, for those who haven't seen it. Ah, so that was just to give you a taste of, you know, how active live streaming is. I think the difference between um, QVC um, and, you know, how we sell in China is that it's a very, you, you're expected to be sold to. Um, so it's a very, culturally, it's very, very different. Um, but, you know, it's, you know, the, the amount of volume that goes through these channels is incredible. I think, in, you know, live streaming has only been around since 2016, so it's relatively yeah. new. But we did over... You know, last year, over 11, 11, I think they did over 20 billion, R, 20 billion RMB over that period. Just goes to show you how- That's how very impressive. Yeah. Ah. I'm sorry. And then <laughs> another example was um, we used Mar Maria Sharapova, who is the spokesperson for Supergoop. Um, and we ran some campaigns with her in China, which was um, a, a big success. And um, we're very proud to say that, you know, um, one of the hero products from Supergoop, the Unseen Sunscreen is, you know, one of the one of the favorite sunscreen from products now within its first year in China, which is exciting. Um, again, um, you know, in China we use all these different video um, um, channels to um, to you know to broadcast any of our messages. Um, so, and unlike not, it's not just like using YouTube. We have to be 
fluent and um, being able to distribute these channels at any one time and and the traffic will you know differ just on any given day um, just another example of some of the, what we do we do a lot of pop-up shops um, so you can see super ordinary up here with some of our brands um, pharmacy Sunny's face um, dr. Dennis gross skin Iceland um, super goop the ordinary is our new brand um, which is a very very popular brand um, Malin and gets and hum nutrition which is a beauty brand and um, Olaplex, um, which is one of, I think is one of the best <laughs> shampoos I've ever used, but it's great. I'm very happy to have that. And Way, which is Jen Atkins' brand, um, who's famous for, you know, working with the Kardashians. So mm -hmm. um, a lot of these brands we're launching and the Milk Makeup is um, a new brand, which we just recently launched. So um, with that, that's just a quick introduction. Um, Mira, I'll, I'll pass it back to you. Okay, thanks for the introduction. Um, so I think uh, people are wondering that why did you choose the beauty industry? Because, you know, uh, I know beauty is maybe one of the most popular category in China uh, and it's still growing, but it's also one of the most competitive category. Like you have so many big players like L'Oreal, Estee Lauder Group, you have J Beauty, K Beauty brands. And in recent years, you have so many competitors from China, like C Beauty brands. So yeah. why did you decide to, you know, explore this beauty industry? Why did you decide to work with beauty brands? So, um, I, you know, my, my previous past, I've always believed that you have to look at the big trends globally and you've always got to have a, a view of where this, where the market's going. Um, you know, the big, big trend is that, um, you know, the Chinese consumer is one that's traveling to their into discovery and three, um, you know, beauty has always been um, a, a category that's done well in, in up cycles and down cycles. Mm -hmm. um, I think if you look at what the average Chinese consumer is spending in beauty per year, um, you know, the big story here is like Japan and Korea and the US are spending between $200 and $300 per person per year, where China was always spending around $50. Mm -hmm. So the market size is just so big. So, you know, I think with a lot of questions that I saw coming in were questioning about, you know, how do you compete with all the CBD brands or the KBD brands? I think there's always going to be room for everyone in this market, um, whether it's an Australian beauty brand or, a, you know, a, a Brazilian beauty brand. Mm -hmm. um, the market is so big and I don't think one player or one um, country can own the whole market. Okay. I, I agree with you because, you know, uh, Chinese people have a huge demand for for beauty products, even though like uh, during the COVID-19, we have to wear masks. but there are still many girls who want to buy lipsticks even though they have to wear masks so this is yes. really yeah a huge a huge market so um maybe uh you have introduced some of your brands so maybe uh i don't know uh do you have like specific criteria to choose these brands like how do you choose them uh, like how do you decide whether to work with them or not sure so choosing a brand it's pretty uh, a very very involved process for us it's not as simple as you know someone you know um emailing me and saying oh this is a brand you know we're doing this much sales i think what we do is there's three things we do um when we analyze a brand one obviously we we have to test the product i think we've become pretty strong i think everyone in our teams are very fluent in the category of product that they operate so whether it's personal care hair care hair color or whether it's skin care or color um, so our team has we've got a very deep bench in each of those categories. So we test the products and when we test it, it's not just internally testing, it's actually testing it with the KOLs, mm -hmm. our sub distributors, our partners, um, the retailers, and we, we get a lot of feedback. Um, the second thing we do is we actually try and figure out like what the actual opportunity of that product within the category is. So as you know, most, you know, we believe in the 80, 20 rule. So every, every, portfolio of brands typically has you know 20 percent of the products represent 80 percent of the revenue yeah. so what that means we always try to see whether those hero products can stand on its their own two feet in china so an example of this would be um you know we looked at a, a coffee scrub business once which you know great packaging great branding but 
we looked at it compared to what was out there in the market and we just could not compete on price. So when we're, when we're put into a scenario where we have to compete on price, we kind of start to take a step back. We prefer competing on brands. So when we really believe that the brand can actually survive and people, you know, what we call like a, an emotional love brand where people are willing to pay up for that to mm -hmm. own it. So, you know, brands that we ca carry, like um, any one of our brands, I would say fit within that mold and people are willing to pay up for it. So I think that's part of the, the selection process because it's a lot of analysis, desktop research. We also want to know that the brand can scale. Um, there's no point having 25 brands and they're all doing $1 million after three years. You know, yeah. we prefer having a smaller portfolio, but brands can scale. Um, and it's not just revenue wise, it means, you know, the infrastructure in the home market. So most of our brands that we work with, typically I would say as a benchmark, have between 30 to 50 people in their, in their offices, in their domestic market. So mm -hmm. China's, they take a very, very serious view about China. So they really, truly believe that China could become at least a very significant part of their P&L or revenue in the future. So we, we it, you know, it's a bit of a courting process, but eventually once we've done all our homework and we think that they're the right partner and, and also there's a personality fit as well. Yeah. Um, we also, we, we, you, know, you know, we do this because we really love that brand. So. So, it, you know, it's more, it's a little bit more of an art than just a science saying yes or no. Um, in the beginning, we would have obviously taken whatever we can get. But right now, what we're doing is really trying to be very, very focused and building a very solid portfolio. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think that's a smart move. Like you said, you don't really need a lot of brands. You may just need a few that can really compete in the market that can be the 20%. Uh, to compete with the, the rest 80%. I think that's very smart. So talking about, you know, choosing brands, I know some of your brands are actually very new when they enter the China market. I mean, new to China, China Chinese customers. So right. uh, I think for new brands to the market, it's very important to, you know, uh, the step from zero to one. It's because uh, during this time, you need to build your whole, uh, brand image to it's like it's all depends on the first impression to your customers in China. So how do you do? Like how do you help them to start from zero to one? Yeah, I, I mean a lot of that is to be honest, it's a little bit of a secret sauce what we do. <laughs> yeah, I think, um, you know, I think anyone out there listening in who have worked in a brand um, truly knows launching a brand is incredibly hard. Um, yeah. Yeah, you know, and, and like and to the point, it's like I would advise most people not to do it because it's spent a lot of money and it's very expensive, and you know you have to iterate and it's very hard. So it becomes you know even more challenging to do it in China because first of all, there's no access to the information gateway of Instagram and, and Facebook. Um, so you really have to educate the the the, the end consumer. I think. You know, without giving away too much, I think the, the the secret is really being able to communicate clearly and consistency in, on a consistent basis to your consumer. Mm -hmm. There's no easy shortcut in building a brand. You know, typically the build a brand, it in my view, it takes five years mm -hmm. um, to do a um, So anyone that, you know, I think some of the mistakes that some brands make is that, oh, I can come into China and I'll do $10 million revenue in year one. Yeah, there's some partners out there that will, will promise you that. And I can pretty much guarantee you this, the difficulty is year two and year three when you have to change partner because, you know, they've been, you've been discounting your product so heavily. Mm -hmm. There's a difference, there's a, a seasonal difference between what I call, you know, brand marketing and discounting. So to really um, build a brand, you have to invest. You really, truly invest. So part of what we do um, as super ordinary is we invest between 20 to 40% of our revenue into the market. It's, you mean it's for first lot. year or for how many years? Usually the first year and sometimes more than 40%. Oh. And I think that's why we've managed to get such explosive growth in some of our brands. And um, we, um, you know, we realize that it's a, it's a, it's a very competitive market yeah. and, um, you know, it's it's not for those faint-hearted for sure, um, but I think um, you know if you get it right, you know the the opportunity is incredible. 
So I think zero to one is, is it's all about, um, you know, t also educating the, the, the foreign brand, you know, how to adapt and to really release some of the, the guardrails so that we can do what we do. And cause that's what we understand the Chinese consumer. We understand how to localize the brand, give the, give each skew a nickname or hashtag mm -hmm. and, yeah. really kind of, you know, work with the brand so that the brand feels local, even though it's a foreign brand. So I think that's, that's a lot of hard work. And I think, you know, I, I have to give my team like incredible credit because there's, there's, they take such pride in that and they're good at it. Um, and I think that really differentiates what we do from a lot of our competitors. Yeah, yeah. I think that's, uh, I know it's a lot of secrets of your <laughs> business, but I also appreciate that you also shared a lot of like experience to, you know, for us to build a brand from zero to one. So after you, you have already built this brand from zero to one, like, uh, your brands like pharmacy uh, drunk elephant i think these brands are already um i'm not sure to say it's well known in china but it's actually it's at least have its own group of customers have its own group of fans already so after that how do you grow them how do you make them bigger how do you build them from yeah. one to 100 yeah you know it's a great question i think you know the hardest part, if you have to look on the curve, is the year zero to one is definitely the hardest. Mm -hmm. Once you get, you know, once you've really um, um, managed and um, the, the, a consistent message around the brand, so people are repeating what the brand stands for to each other. So it's not just like a product story; it's really what the brand story is. Mm -hmm. I think that's where you can really start putting your foot off the take your foot off the accelerator on the marketing spend. And you can actually start working on, you know, channel expansion and channel investment. So what we do is um, we typically keep a very tight leash on the channels in the beginning before we start to expand. Um, and when the time comes, we start to work on, you know, live streaming and start putting them into the regular like TV programming cycle about how we promote the brand. Um, there's no point working with a big live streamer if, if the brand's not well known, you have to yeah. wait until the brand's got enough um, credibility that so your return on your invested capital is actually much better. Um, I could I can say that typically most of our brands are growing over a hundred percent a year, um, and that's because you know it sounds a lot, but you know um, Luxury Beauty in 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 the U.S. is is growing at forty percent on Amazon. So you know it it is, sounds a lot, but it's it's you know it, it is. Um, reflective of the market um i think the other thing what we do is we um we try and um you know make sure we release some of the other SKUs into the market as well um and then you know also what we do is we start working with more collaborations so brand collaborations brand yeah. partnership so you know i always say a brand is represented about you imagine it as a person like who who they he or she hangs out with who they play with that shows you like who that brand is. So, you know, we, we start to working with you know, some of the, um, the retailers that we just showed you, whether it's Sephora or the Colorist or Wild Beauty, you know, we start to start doing that play group so that brands can be seen in these channels as well. Yeah, I agree. I think the co-branding is um, actually also a, like a trend in China. Like the brands, they like to work with um, brands from uh, maybe not from the same category, but from other categories. Like maybe a beauty brand is working with a food brand. Uh, like Haiti yeah. is working with Fenty Beauty. It's actually right. very, mm, looks very, mm, very, very new, a, a new kind of collaboration to the customers. And they are actually willing to buy this limited edition of product. Yeah, I mean, yeah, you've seen it with Kentucky Fried Chicken or, or Haiti. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I mean, it, it, it's kind of a stretch sometimes when you think about what they would, you know, some, I would say some US marketers would be like cringing and working with a KFC market, but it does work. And I think the, yeah. um, the, the, um, the experience, you know, it brings a brand to life, to be honest, because, yeah. you know, most of our brands, I mean, only, I would say only a quarter of our portfolio is general trade. The other um, three quarters are cross border. So you, you actually don't physically get to touch those products until mm -hmm. you bought them. So, you know, it, that is the challenge. So we have to do these brand partnerships, but I think 
you know what we're what we're happy with is that you know all these brands that we work with um a lot of the live streamers all these influencers get to come and work with super ordinary on many different levels um and that's you know and that allows them to expand their um, portfolio reach as well okay so yeah, you also mentioned a lot about like working with KOLs and you mentioned you're working with um, Austin Lee, these top KOLs and you're also like before you even launch the brand, you will have some KOLs, some, some customers or some KOCs to try your product. So I think this is also um, uh, the frequently asked questions because we also collected some questions from our registrants. So one of the most frequently asked question is your KOL and KOC strategy. So people want to know that how do you think the KOL partnership is, uh, is it really that important for you to build a brand, for you to drive sales? And like, how do you choose this KOL? How do you select them? How do you really choose this high quality KOL or KOC? Yeah. Well, <laughs> You know, coming from the U.S., I think we were we were kind of spoiled because we were given a lot of these um, <clears throat> influencer management tools like Refluence or Creative IQ or Aspire IQ, all these different platforms or Tribe Analytics. And what that did was, you know, they would kind of like index KOLs or influencers um, mm -hmm. according to performance and impressions and so forth. When you came to China, not, you have to throw that all out the window and it yeah. really... You had to go to it was like going to a dating agency and saying okay and the agency would say well i have all these people who do you want to use and I'm like, no idea so it was like threw me into the deep end um you know what we started doing was really building up our own internal database and indexing our own kols to see how they performed on the different channels so most of them um you know were working on xiaohongshu or, or or they were live streamers um, and we have a team now of, of around 10 people in our KOL management team that basically, we don't manage our own agency, but we work with 40,000 influencers now, KOLs. And um, what we've seen is that um, we've, been, we've been able to like um, bifurcate the KOLs into categories. So um, whether it's, you know, moisturizers or toners or, you know, bronzers, we know it's which KOL category to go to, mm -hmm. to work with. And um, just like the US, most of the, um, um, you know, if you use the same KOL twice, the return on the capital of your investment capital is obviously a lot lower. Mm -hmm. So it is important. I would say that um, about 50% of our marketing budget of that, whether it's 20 or 40% of revenue is spent on a KOL investment. Um, so it's a very, very active part of our business model. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I don't think it's going away anytime soon. I think if, in fact, um, you know, just what some of the, the data points I was giving you about live streaming over 11.11, um, yeah. um, you know, the sheer size of, the, of that market now is so big. So, you know, as a strategy, I think it's kind of interesting because some of our brands now are doing customized palettes and products with those large KOLs, oh. which will be exciting to see over the next 12 months. Yeah, that's, that's like one of the uh, key market yeah. strategy from many brands, actually. Like they have this co-collaborations with the KOLs and okay. they launch co-branding products with the KOLs. Hi, Steve. Um, so Steve Bittinger's got a question for me. What is the opportunity for online hair color? Um, so, oh, hi, Alice. <laughs> um, so um, online hair color, I think there's a big, you know, big opportunity there, Steve. Um, we work with a brand called Lime Crime, which does hair color. Um, you know, what we like about it is, you know, the LTV is really great on that brand because um, the repeat purchases, um, you know, there is a big trend, obviously, in great coverage in China. You know, there still is a trend for people to go to the salon to do that, um, that, that, um, that um, you know, to buy their hair. But... I still think, you know, more and more people will buy, um, um, you know, hair color. Um, next question, how well is Clean Beauty doing? I think Clean Beauty is still probably six months to nine months off be be before coming. That's one trend that hasn't really truly um, lifted off um, um, just yet. I mean, we're talking to a number of Clean Beauty brands in the US, but 
Um, when we tested into the market, we haven't seen much of um, you know a reception or a demand for it. So, um, Mirik, are you back? Yeah, sorry. I think my connection was unstable. <laughs> sorry, sorry. Okay. You, you can continue. Yeah, for for, for uh, the question. Questions here. Um, Julian Chu, um, are you planning to expand into other markets besides China? Um, yeah, funny you said that. Um, we are actually looking at um, you know, Southeast Asia. Um, we are, um, you know, my previous business was in Southeast Asia, so we, we have some ex experience there. But that probably won't be until another year or so. And the, the other thing is Timor has a lot of, it, um, um, you know, a lot of its veins and tentacles through Lazada, through Southeast Asia. So it makes it interesting for us to be able to um, expand um, in that direction. Um, but it's not, a, it's not an immediate priority. Um, uh, maybe for the rest of the questions, we will wait for the Q and A session. We 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 can continue uh, yes. our yeah interview first. Sorry. Answer the rest of the sure after it's okay. Great. Yeah, but for oh, everyone, sorry. you can just type your questions in the chat box. Yeah, we we will answer them uh, in the end. Okay, so next question is about COVID nineteen because, uh, like um, many like me like many brands and many media is saying that yeah. during the COVID nineteen in China, like uh, because we have to wear masks, so the the cosmetics actually doesn't sell very very well. Instead, the skincare products is becoming more popular. Yeah. So, do you think uh, is this also like an impact to your brands? And do you think? there will be a new normal after the COVID-19? Like, will it change the market, change the beauty market? Yeah, so that's a, that's a good question. And I see, Alice, you asked the question too. So, okay, so COVID-19 um, um, was very, very short-lived compared to what's happened globally for, you know, obvious reasons. Um, most of our brands initially took a very big dip, like, for two weeks, and then there was a huge resurgence. In fact, you know, we're we're you know month on month, you know, continually to do stronger across most of our brands. I think um, globally, um, you know, I think this trend about self care is really going to be with us. Um, DIY beauty, um, you know, not going to the salon and doing things at home is 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 for here to, with us to stay i think it's i think we've all had our own experiences of of this of um of covid 19 i mean I, I was in america for the last three and a half months um and, and you know coming back to see it that back in asia i think i think china's weathered the storm i think what's going to happen is that the china market is actually going to surpass the u.s market in terms of size very quickly because of this i think um the retailers in the u.s are going to continually be um, hurt by, you know, whether it's, you know, they, you know, people go to Sephora to, to discover brands and test products. And if you can't try products on because of, you know, the fear of, of, um, in transmitting this virus, I think that's going to have a big impact. Um, I think China has been so far, so, you know, very immunized. I, I mean, even I'm in Hong Kong right now and even Hong Kong, you know, a big scare is, you know, 30 new cases where, you know, the U.S. has got 73,000 cases a day. So I, th I feel like, you know, the market's much more controlled. I think we've lost Miro again. Um, so I'm going to go straight to the, to the other questions. Um, okay, so um, what are my thoughts on Perfect Diary? Um, so I know the company and the founder fairly well. Um, I think what he's done is incredible. Um, you know, built a business that is clearly, you know, was compared to Glossier at the beginning. Um, I think when you look at Chinese beauty brands, um, there's a tendency that a lot of these Chinese beauty brands either fall into this very, um, the design is very similar, or you have some brands that try and stand out. So, you know, Perfect Diary's done a good job in really thinking about brand collaborations. They've done, you know, collaborations with like um, a lot of English, um, you know, like Big Ben and, and the Tower of London and really beautiful packaging. They use the same packaging that most of the top, top, top brands in the US use. So they're not making brands, they're all their products in, in, in China. A lot of it's being sourced from all around the world and the product quality is actually very good. I think 
they've been very good at pricing the brand products at a very competitive rate, whether it's compared to Beauty Blender or or any of these other brands or, or you know, um, R&T or, or Morphe brushes, you know, Perfect Eyes really managed to say, well, I see what you're doing and I can do it better um, at a much better price. So they've managed to be very, very smart how they've built their brand. Um, but, you know, in China right now, the brands to watch are there's Hedon, there's um, uh, Judy Doll, Color Key. There's so many of these exciting brands to watch right now, which are dominating the, the color market. Yeah, you are actually answering my next question, sorry. <laughs> because many people ask about the sea beauty brands, like do you feel there is threats from them or do you think um, there is something we can learn from sea beauty brands? Um, I think sea beauty brands, I think the, the, the one massive advantage they have is supply chain. You just mm -hmm. think about how do, how do I compete with a sea beauty brand where you know, I'm, I'm buying products from the UK or, or, you know, the West Coast of the US, shipping it to Hong Kong, you know, repackaging packaging it and then sending it directly to the consumer. It's really competitive. So there's a glass ceiling on the size of the brand that, uh, the, of, of the revenue we can do. Let's call it, I don't know, a billion RMB for, for one brand like at the very top. There's some examples of brands that can do that much. So if you're manufacturing in if you're manufacturing in China, which, you know, actually we're starting to do some, you know, Super Ordinary is actually manufacturing some brands in China now because we can get around the, the animal testing rule. Um, it allows us to grow much faster. So, so some of our brands we're, we're starting to distribute. So we, we can go head to head with some of the CBD brands. And I think it's all about the storytelling. Mm -hmm. I think what we do well is storytell um, and really bring to life some of our brands and, that's what's really exciting, but you know the market's very big, and you know just as you would you know drink wine from France or Australia or America, you know you drink it from China as well. So you you kind of I don't think it's it's fair to say that you should just because you're a you're, you're biased to your home market, you're not going to try other things. I think you know we live in a world today which we're very um, understanding of other people's cultures and and are willing to try different things all the time. So. I, I still think the market's very, very big. Yeah. So uh, instead of like the supply chain you mentioned, do you think um, for C beauty brands, is there any difference between their marketing strategy and the international brands marketing strategy? Do you think, um, is there something we can, um, I don't know, uh, learn from them or do you think that's not suitable for the international brands? Um, I think we've learned that you have to be, you know, you have to think local mm -hmm. from day one. You can't, um, you can't try and impose any of your marketing strategies and assume that it's going to work. I think most of the people who are on this chat know that. Um, so it's really being, um, you, know, you know, making sure that if you are going to use a Western influencer, to make sure there must be a very, very strong reason why. Yeah. Um, sometimes it's much better to, you know, just go straight deep in and figure out how to work with local um, influencers and KOLs who really, truly understand the market. I mean, everyone's very well educated. Everyone understands what the difference between a chemical or a physical sunscreen. It's not, mm -hmm. it's not new. So um, we have to be a lot smarter in, in, in doing that. So what can we learn? Um, I think the market, new product development is so insane in China. I mean, whatever you can think of has already been on the shelves. <laughs> um, so, um, it's, um, you know, and people are very quick to, um, you know, be, you've got to be careful as well. It's like, if someone doesn't like your product, be careful because it yeah. gets around the market. So you've got to try to drink carefully. Um, but you know, I think, I think at the end of the day, um, the difference you've got to say is the, the products that we create or the products we manage have to be amazing. Like, you know, whether it's, you know, the way the body scrub they, they make or, you know, Olaplex's morning shampoo. I mean, these are phenomenal products. And so I, I go to sleep at night thinking, at least we've got amazing products. So <laughs> it's not to screw it up. Yeah, that's true. In the end, it's about the product. Like your marketing can let customers buy once, but yeah. if you want them to become your re repeated customer, then you will definitely have a good product to... They're never going to buy a product. You know, yeah. never come and repeat. That's correct, yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's true. 
Um, and next is uh, because you also mentioned about like Chinese brands like Perfect Diary. So private traffic is actually uh, like a hot keyword now. So yeah. uh, we know that Perfect Diary is spending a lot of resources in private traffic. Like they have thousands of thousands of WeChat groups and they are talking to, they, they have this, this, this icon called Xiao Wanzi. They are talking to their customers like in the groups every day. Do you think private traffic is also suitable for international brands or do you think, well, it's not working? <laughs> no, it's um, private traffic um, for those who's out, who's out there that do, doesn't understand this. This is, this is traffic that you, you create through community chat groups on WeChat. Um, so as we don't have websites in, in China, um, conversion takes place on, you know, on Tmall or, or Xiangshu on these e-commerce websites. So, so how do you get traffic and how do you get repeat traffic? Um, so buying cheap traffic is always, you know, I'm thinking about this all day long. Like, how do we do that? Mm -hmm. um, you know, Super Ordinary actually does work in the private traffic groups um, and we do build um, communities around our brand. But um, at the end of this year, we're going we'll to be, we're going to be announcing something new, which is going to bring in a lot of private traffic to us. Mm -hmm. um, so we believe there's um, once you, cause once you own that traffic, we can bring those people every single day. So it's really, um, it's really important to have that, um, that, that traffic, which you can tap into. Um, so, you know, customer acquisition costs obviously will go down and then you can run a lot more, um, 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 campaigns to bring more traffic in. Yeah. I think private traffic has to work with the public traffic. Like you, you are on Tmall, you, you are, um, you, you use their public traffic to get new customers, but then you can convert them to your private traffic and then let them become your repeated customer. I think it has to work together instead of just yeah. public or just private. Yeah, it's, it's not, it's definitely not um, straightforward. I think, you know, when you have to draw the, the flow of what has to happen, but I do believe it's an important part of Super Ordinary strategy for Q4 this year and next year is to build out more, um, you know, own more traffic, um, mm -hmm. not just not within China, it's globally. Um, I, I, th I see this as a global, you know, platform what we're doing. Okay. Um, so next, uh, it's also a question asked by our attendees. Like, how do you see the future? I don't know the the policy of animal testing. Will it change in China? Like next year, because we hear a lot of rumors, like it will be lifted in the Q1 next year, or someone say, oh no, it's not. It's still be there. So I don't know. Do you have any insider news about this? Um, <laughs> yeah, so, yeah, it's not, it's not um, I you know it's it's. You know, it depends who you ask. If you ask, I'm sure if you ask anyone at Sephora, they'll tell you it's going away tomorrow. But <laughs> most people, most yeah. people are expecting um, to go um, in stages. There's been a lot of uh, you know, animal rights groups that have been putting a lot of pressure. So naturally, you see a lot of verbal um, conversations about it. Um, I think politically, I don't see why it should go away anytime soon. Uh, that's my own personal opinion because I think. The market is doing, you know, the domestic market is growing very nicely um, for Chinese brands. So, you know, but at the same time, they realize that, you know, foreign brands want to enter the market. So it's a natural, um, a natural barrier. Um, I don't think we will see, um, you know, functional products. Yeah. Um, allowed to, um, you know, whether it's OTC creams or you know, sunscreens, I think That's all right, of those yeah. products will take a long time to, to, to get past, even if animal testing is released. Um, it'll probably only apply to, you know, um, what they call special cosmetics. Mm -hmm. I think, um, you know, it, it's wait and see. I, so my personal view is, you know, build out your cross-border channel, build out your marketing channel. So when it does go away, then, you know, that's upside for, 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 for you. And, um, but I wouldn't count on a strategy saying, no, it's going to be removed. Yeah, go cross border first, like at least build the brand first and then you can, I don't know, maybe the policies will be changed and then you can, you will, you will be able to enter the China, enter the market and you will be able to have like even the retail shops, but you can still go cross border first. 
Well, that's right. I think what we do with some of our brands, we start to manufacture for them in China too, so that wow. they are able to, um, to build their brands in China as well, because I think you have to take the long-term view here. Mm-hmm. Um, but you mentioned about like manufacture the, 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 the product in China. Do you think the customers will feel different, like made in China, made in uh, Europe, made in the US? Do you think I, I think that's always going to be, um, you know, but I think, you know, I think that's the international perception is that made in China is, is inferior, but as we all know, all the best um, um, OEM and ODM companies are now located in China. So whether it's Cosmax or Colmar or, you know, any of the big, you know, Intercost, they're all got um, factories and they all are amazing. Um, so they could, whatever you can make in, in the US or Europe, they can make the same product in China. It's yeah. all about the raw ingredients and bring them in. Um, and sometimes you can bulk fill overseas and bring it in and manufacture it in China. So there's many different ways you can do it. Made in China versus made, I think the customer, the consumer, um, you know, yes, some may be affected by it, but I think ultimately, I think um, it shouldn't matter that much. Yeah, I think especially the young customers, the Gen Zers, they are they are actually accepting a lot of Chinese brands. So I think yeah. they are becoming more open to about made in China products. So maybe yeah. in the future, yeah, more and more people will be accepting this this uh, made in China products. Okay, so um, next question is also asked by one of our attendees. So uh, what's the biggest challenge do you think uh, to build to build a new brand? To bring a new brand to China, what's the biggest challenge? Um, the biggest challenge. I think this. The biggest challenge <clears throat> depends. I think. I think when you first, if I was sitting and I owned a brand and I'm thinking about entering the China market, some of the things I would, I would, I would um, kind of advise it, is making sure that the brand is at a certain size in its domestic market first. Mm-hmm. Because if the brand is too small, you're trying to spend marketing dollars in two markets to build a brand in two different markets, which no one knows about. So that's a challenge. So, you know, for us as a business, it's super ordinary. It becomes difficult because, you know, in an ideal situation, the brand's got some recognition in China already. It has some Taobao velocity, meaning that people are in the Daigo market are bringing it across and talking about it and selling, reselling it. Yeah. So it makes the job easier. I think so, you know, starting a new brand, um, you have to, there, there is a lot of luck involved. I think um, there was a question earlier on about clean beauty. And I've seen so many of these little clean, clean beauty brands try and come to China and, and people just don't care about it. Mm-hmm. Because yeah. I think about brand, first of all, I think clean beauty and, and a lot of those tenants will come in in the later stage um, as, you know, people travel a lot more and understand the world a lot more. But I feel that, Right now, you just got to be lucky about and listen to the social listening tools to see what's trending and what's not. So, you know, when we launched pharmacy, um, one of the trends was there was a trend in Manuka honey. So we knew that we could ride on the details of that trend and the honey potion really t- took off. Um, so that's one of the challenges. The second challenge is, you know, finding a, you know, finding a partner like ourselves that can you truly understand the brand and, and the storytelling about the brand. I think, um, there's a temptation to discount. Um, I know I saw a question earlier on that someone said, well, how do you price your product versus MSRP versus our domestic market? Should it be at you know, 30% or 50% higher? So you know, pricing is really important. So to make sure that you really, really drill down to look, look at all your competitors and see where they're pricing and where you're entering the market at and whether you have a, a pricing proposition. Most foreign brands can't compete with the local brands in, in that same product category. Mm-hmm. So, and typically, what what we see is that, you know, we typically index our pricing around ten to twenty percent higher than domestic U.S. retail pricing. But overall, during the sales events and you know, eleven eleven, you know, it kind of flattens itself out. So, yeah. um, you know, it ends up being pretty much on par. So there's very little arbitrage that you can do. Mm-hmm. But at least you know like how to control the price. You set a minimum retail price for the speech promotions, and then you have like a, a daily retail price for That's right. yeah, yeah. So so you, you at least have like a, a pricing strategy for like for yeah, each you, year. 
I think this year is very interesting, Miriam, because what we've seen is that, you know, 11.11, um, um, which is coming around the corner in a couple of months, you know, is going to be, you know, we do 30, 40% of our annual revenue in one month. So, you know, what, you know, we're preparing all the sales um, um, events, um, campaigns right now for that. And that's really complicated because, you know, it's getting very, very competitive and there's a yeah. lot of pressure every single brand to be part of this festival. And as you know, it's not a one day best festival. It goes on for like three or four times during the month and it's, it's crazy. So it's, it's, it's super, super exciting. But at the same time, you've got, you know, everyone has to sharpen their pencils to come up with the best promotion. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, that's true. Okay, so next is the final, final tips. What's your final tips for uh, international indie beauty brands? <laughs> Who wants to uh, enter China market? Well, let me see if there's any questions here that I can help answer okay. before. I, um, marketing budget month distribution challenge. Sorry, everyone. Uh, um, maybe is men's grooming skincare becoming a hot category? Um, so we don't have any. Um, I, I would say actually, Malin and Getz is a is probably a, it's a lifestyle brand, but there's a lot of men's grooming um, products there. Lifestyle brands definitely are on the up and up um, because they speak to the um, I guess speak to the personality of the people that we're marketing to. So you know, Malin Getz is a bright, um, you know, um, modern, um, exciting, you know, very very founder driven company come by two partners, two guy partners who um, have built an incredible story um, and great products. So that in itself is, is giving me a lot of excitement about the men's grooming category. Um, you know, there isn't the need, obviously people don't shave as much as they do in Europe or US. So, yeah. you know, having balls is not as big um, or um, I would say, but, you know, products like hair loss products are quite exciting because, you know, there's 200 million people in China losing their hair, yeah. of which um, the majority is, I think is, you know, I've got to be careful what I say, but I think so that's, you know, those categories are big categories, but they're, tri they're typically drugstore categories. So we haven't seen, you know, the, the upgrade into in what we've seen. And, you know, if you walk down the aisle of Target, you'll see all these really cool new brands like, um, you know, deodorant brands, which are, you know, fifteen dollars where they used to be three dollars. So we haven't seen that yet, but I think that's exciting because that allows for margin expansion in in, in that category. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, next question: Where would you recommend to look at if you would like to find reliable and suitable KOCs for the personal care sector, apart from browsing in Xiaohongshu or Douyin, etc.? <laughs> well, there's nothing online. I would say that's you could, you can do. You, you really have to have a local partner like ourselves that does that for you because it's it's just information that's not available on your fingertips. Um, you, I mean, so when I first started, um, we I put my office right above Xiaohongshu in, and um, mm. um, and and our office was literally above them. I literally rode the elevator trying to speak to people there and trying to find out what how to work with them because it's very complicated. Um, so unfortunately, Xiaohongshu is a good part of it. They, they do vet and verify a lot of the KOLs. Um, but it goes back to trying to find a partner that can work with you. Okay. Uh, next question is, any advice on how should a brand allocate the marketing budget among different distribution channels when first launched in China? Um, okay, so I typically you no, know, in China to use KOLs, it's a pay to play model. So there's no seeding. You can't just send your product out and expect someone yeah. to um, mention it. So uh, that's, that's step one to realize that. So <laughs> it doesn't work. Um, I would say that we would, you should typically allocate a launch budget first, like a fixed amount for your brand. And that depends on what kind of brand you are and how much, but you should, you know, that aside, that, that initial capital will be to really launch a brand. So working with a with someone like with a PR company or someone to really bring together and, and make sure that you get the initial burst. And then it's also about, you know, 
finding, um, as you would in any other market, a consistent KOL investment strategy, um, and making sure that you're on the right channel. So whether you start on Xiaohongshu and start building your presence there, um, on Weibo, or you know some of these other channels, but eventually getting to your initial size, if you're not there already, that you can actually get onto it and start a Timor flagship store. Um, you know, running a Timor flagship store is, is, is requires a lot of people. Um, you know, every brand that we manage has between four to eight people managing that brand, dedicated solely to the brand. So it's, it's a lot of work. So I think, you know, in terms of allocation, I would say if I had, had a pie, I would say at least 50% um, would be to influencer, you know, a third of that would be to launch strategy, to a launch event, and yet the remainder to channel marketing and channel performance, so buying, buying traffic. Um, that's very important. And, you know, there's many, many tools that you can do that with. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, next question. Uh, what's your view on emerging boutiques like Little B, Harmay, in terms of branding and sales? I, I think yeah, you yeah. mentioned this. Yeah, this has been exciting. I mean, obviously I mentioned the colorist and wild beauty. Little B, um, Little Beast, which is it's also known as, um, they do um, a multi-brand store. It's very small. They're typically around, I would say, 600 to 800 square feet. Um, but the, it's really good. They they curated the store really nicely. They have flowers and you yeah. know they're all in Paris and Saint and, and so forth. And same with Harme. I mean, these they've done a really good job in creating. I think a lot of U.S. retailers would learn a lot from you know from and be really impressed from the design. Um, I think what they've done quite well is um, they've made the stores very, um, for lack of a better word, Instagrammable. Like very mm -hmm. like you know, very image driven. So you get a lot of um, AOLs going in there just taking photos all the time. So it's, it does create a lot of content. Um, I think from a sales point of view, I don't think it really drives, it's more of a marketing um, um, activity. And, um, you know, um, but it's, it's great to see because I, I love visiting these stores and seeing what they're doing. And, um, you know, people get very excited, um, but I would, I would, I would, generally advise a lot of people who go to China to go visit these other retailers, go see Perfect Diary, go see the colorist and, um, and, and, and try the products because I think, you know, it's, it's really impressive. Yeah, I think this, um, this offline retailers, uh, many, many brands actually use it as an experience store. Like they don't really want the retail store to sell stuff. They want it to provide um, an experience to the customers and that customers to experience the whole product like that you can actually try the lipsticks everything and maybe in the end the customers still buys um, online because they may get more discount may get more promotion online but the offline store can be a like a good branding strategy for that's for, for brands well, that, well that's how i think about like you know if i look at amazon in the us you know people build up their brands but they will start to convert more of their beauty purchases on amazon because it's convenience it's you know prime shipping and so forth so and that's what's happening with with china china's really led the way in showing that convenience is what drives their conversion on some of these platforms so you know if, if you have a wallet that's tied to Tmall or wechat um, you're very sticky to that platform just as you are in the US and Amazon. So I think it's exciting because I think globally we're entering into this phase where convenience is going to make sure that where the traffic goes to. So yeah. um, going down to a physical store is great to discover, but are you really going to go down there every single time to purchase? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Uh, yeah, we have a new question. Realistically, what's the minimum budget you need to launch a brand? <laughs> That's very um, hard to say. We're brand with no animal testing. And for brands with no animal yeah, testing, can only look at the brand. It's, it, every brand's different, and it, it highly depends on the brand and its domestic market. Um, if, if you have to index it, so if it's a bigger brand, um, you know, and it has you know very well a lot of infrastructure behind it, and it's quite well known. Obviously, you don't need to spend as much, but if it's a younger brand and you need to differentiate it. It's a lot more expensive. Yeah. Uh, okay. Mm, do we have any more questions? Oh, we have one more. 
I heard TikTok is launching a beauty focuses platform. Do you have any idea when it will be launched? How do you think the brands and agencies will work with TikTok on this? Um, so we work with Douyin on TikTok very, very actively, you know, across all our brands. Um, I think, you know, it's, it's not surprising that they, they're going to go down this channel. Um, the question is, how are they going to work with beauty brands? Are they going to um, do the JD model where they basically buy product and do a wholesale model? Or would they do a more of a, a um, um, you know, would they do a, um, you know, just a, a, a fee sharing model? Um, I, I haven't heard what, anything about when this is going to be launched, so I don't know. Um, but, you know, I'm, I'm sure if, if, if it will find out soon. Okay. Um, do we have any more? Um, do we have any other questions from the audience? What's your suggestion for multi-brand e-commerce China market business? It is really hard to build platform awareness at the beginning. Yeah, um, I would. Uh, I would stay away from doing that. I think you know, <laughs> the this is I would call it high stakes poker. Um, yeah. You know, if you're truly going to try and compete. Um, in a in a in a multi brand e commerce um, multi brand it's 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 death by a thousand cuts. You're you're competing against Alibaba and Tencent, and yeah. it's just like it's it's virtually impossible. We've seen so many failed multi, um, platforms in, in China even the last three years, um, and it's I think that model is is definitely much more suited to the U.S. than it is to China. Yeah, it's really hard to compete with the big players like Taobao, Timor, or even like, uh, like platforms like Xiaohongshu, they are, they are famous for their social community, but in terms of the e-commerce, they still can't compete with Timor. It's really hard. Really hard, it's, it's really hard. <laughs> yeah. um, anyway, thank you very much for having me today, I appreciate it. Thank you, thank you for coming. And I think that's the end of the event. So if anyone has any other questions, you can just reach out to uh, Julian directly. Uh, so thank you everyone for attending and thanks Julian. Bye-bye. Yeah, thanks everyone. Thank Bye. Everyone. You. Bye. Bye.